So in the epistle for this Mass of the Requiem from Mr. Albert Burgess <clears throat> is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 4. Brethren, we will not have you ignorant concerning them that are asleep, that you be not sorrowful, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them who have slept through Jesus will God bring with him. For this we, we say unto you to the, in the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who remain unto the coming of the Lord, shall not, pre not prevent them who have slept. For the Lord himself shall come down uh, from heaven with commandment and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead who are in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, shall be taken up together with them in the clouds to meet Christ unto the air, and so shall we be always with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort ye one another with these words. And then the gospel, we stand for the gospel. Taking that according to St. John, chapter 11. At that time Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But now also I know that whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. Jesus saith to her, Thy brother shall rise again. And Martha saith to him, I know that, that, that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus saith to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, although he be dead, shall, shall live. And every one that liveth and believeth in me shall not taste death forever. Believest thou this? She saith to him, Yea, Lord, I have believed that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, who art come into this world. Thus are the words of today's holy gospel. Oh, that's good. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. In the beginning, when God created the world, it says at the end of each of the six days of creation, God created this world absolutely perfect. He said, let there be light, and light was made. He brought forth all the living things immediately with absolute perfection, created this world in six days. At the end of each of the days, he said, and God looked at the work that he had done, and he saw that it was good. The light was good, the day was good, the night was good, the earth was good, all of the animals, and everything he did was good. On the seventh day, he rested from his work. And the very last creature he created was man. He created Adam. And he told Adam, <clears throat> I have made all these things for you. Made them all for you that you might use them in order to get to me. Adam then asked for a helpmate and was given Eve from his side. And the work of creation was complete. And everything that God did and everything that God does is always good. You look at the world that he created. You'll see all the insects, all of the animals, the sun, the stars, the plants. Every one of them is most beautiful. And if you get a microscope and you look more closely at them, you discover they're more beautiful. And if you get a telescope and you look very far into the stars, you discover they're more beautiful. And the more you look at the things of God, you discover they are more and more beautiful. Because God's goodness knows no end. One of the ancient languages is our English language. And there was a, a, a great Jesuit many years ago. He said, he noticed in the ancient languages, all the words for God are four-letter words. Like the tetragram of the Jews, or Deus in Latin, D-E-U-S. But in our English language, we looked around at the whole world and we saw that it is good. And seeing that everything is good and must be created by good, we use the word good, G-O-O-D, and that is God. God is good, and all things that come from him are good. Later on, one of the O's was dropped, and it became the word God when we refer to the creator of good. And it became the word good when it came to all the things that he did. But God and good 
can never be separated one from another. And St. Paul would tell us later on, we experience trials. We experience tribulations and difficulties and sorrows. But all things are unto good to those that are of the household of the faith. Good is from God. Good leads to God. And without God, there is evil. Without God, there is absence. St. Thomas describes evil, very simple definition. All that evil is, is the absence of an ought good. We say that a table is good if it has a top and four legs. But if one leg is removed and one leg is absent, the table is called evil. It is not called evil because it has three legs. It is not called evil because it has a top. It is called evil because there is an absence of a missed leg. A fourth leg is not there. Today we are in the most evil of all times since the founding of the world. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, when the world comes to an end, it will be like under the days of Noah, where people have given themselves over to sin and all manner of sin, and wickedness is all around, and goodness shall go out from the world. Families have lost their goodness. Cities have lost their goodness. Individuals have lost their goodness. And goodness has gone out from the world and is going out more and more. And why is that? Very simple. Good is from God. And God is being removed more and more from our world. More and more from our lives. The only way in which there can be happiness is if God is in us and God is in our homes and God is in our work and God is in our play and God is in our society. He's like the air that fills the balloon. It can't fly, it can't be a balloon if it does not have air inside of it. And God must be inside of all the things that we are and all the things that we do. There are many sorrows in the world today simply because God is not there. We've removed God. Now, God can never be completely removed. God always gives His grace. God always pours out His love. He says it rains upon the just and the unjust alike. He doesn't just rain upon the fields of the just that they may have something to eat. He also rains upon the fields of the unjust that they may have something to eat. On the day of his crucifixion, he made sure the soldiers that were beating him didn't have back pain. He made sure that they were able to swing their arms at his face. He protected them that they would not suffer as they were crucifying him. He made it possible for them to do what they chose to do. The trouble of that day is they hated God. The trouble of that day is they crucified God. God. It was the absence of God that was the trouble of that day on Good Friday, and yet we call that Friday good. And why do we call it good? Because that was the Friday in which God visited evil and allowed himself to be visited by evil, and he poured his divine love into it, and he poured out his blood and there was a transformation. It all started with a soldier who, with great hatred, wanted to make sure that Christ was dead. And he took a spear and he pierced it in his side and pierced his heart. And out came blood and water. And it touched his hand. And he saw. He saw the open side of the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he believed. And the only way to solve the problems of all the sorrows of the world, everyone's taking medications today. You've got to see a psychiatrist. You've got to see a psychologist. Go to the hospital. First thing they ask now, do you have any suicidal thoughts? Do you feel like you want to hurt yourself? Are you depressed? You have to fill out an antidepressant form before you go into a hospital now. Everyone's depressed. Everyone is sorrowful. 
Everyone has anguish in their hearts. And there's only one reason for that anguish. The absence of God. The more that God is absent, the more there is anguish in our heart. The less he is absent, the less there's anguish in our heart. And if God is fully present in our heart, there is no anguish. That is why our Lord Jesus Christ came to St. Martha. We read about in the Gospel today from St. John. Martha, why are you crying? Martha said, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother would not have died. The only reason my brother died is because you weren't here. And the Gospel tells us why he wasn't there. The word came to our Lord Jesus Christ that he whom thou lovest is sick. And Christ tarried. In other words, he didn't have anything important to do. He just delayed. He just decided to be late. He tarried so much that not only was Lazarus no longer sick while he was dead, not only was Lazarus almost dead, was dead while he was buried, not only was he buried, but he was in the tomb for four days. Already four days in the tomb before the tarried Christ showed up. He was two days walk away when Lazarus was sick. He finally showed up when Lazarus was dead after four days. Lord, how long? How long is it that you have waited? So many of us suffer in life. Lord, how long am I going to go on suffering? How long am I going to struggle? When shalt thou come, O Lord? But before he finally went to raise Lazarus from the dead, his greatest miracle before his own resurrection. Only done a few days before, on Saturday, before he would be crucified. He raised Lazarus from the dead on Saturday, and on the next Friday, he would be crucified himself. But our Lord Jesus Christ said, I am happy. Lazarus is asleep. And they said, Lord, if he's asleep, leave him asleep. No, he is not asleep. He's dead. And then Thomas said, well, if he's dead, there's nothing we can do. Leave him dead. It's not safe to go to Jerusalem now. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, I rejoice that he is dead. I rejoice that he's dead for your sakes. It was for you that he died. Now you might know the power of God. And so they went into Jerusalem. Outside that city, in the town of Bethany, where Lazarus lived, and they went to his tomb, and Christ wept. They said, show me where you have laid him. Show me where he is. And he wept, showing his great love. And the Jews said, boy, see how he loved him. Well, if he loved him so much, why did not he save him from death? And it's interesting about the divine love, one day, Margaret of Castello, whose body is incorrupt, she died when she was 33 years old. She was born blind in Italy. She was born a hunchback. She was born exceedingly ugly. But she was born to very wealthy parents. And at that time, they were very evil, but they weren't able to murder their own child like they do today. So they took their baby and threw her up in the top of a castle. And they said, just leave her as a servant. We don't want her to be seen by anyone. And they brought food to her. And the first time she saw a human being, other than the one that would feed her, was when she was five years old. And they forgot to lock the door of the castle, of the, of the, of the, of the keep. And she went wandering out. And they saw this ugly, disgusting baby come out. And the servants went to throw the baby away. But the wicked father and mother didn't kill her. And they said, you are wicked. The only reason you wouldn't kill this baby, the only reason you wouldn't throw the baby out is because it's your baby. It's your baby, isn't it? And they admitted that it was. And they treated her as a slave. Finally, when she was 16 years old, they brought her to Castello. And the mother and father said to her, the blind Margaret, we're going to bring you there to Castello where there are miracles and we will pray to the saints. And they brought her to Castello and then they left her. When the sacristan came to close the church and lock the church, there was a blind girl wandering about the church. 
And they said, what are you doing here? When my mother and father left me here, they said they were going to come back, and they never did. She spent the rest of her life in that city. She used to have such a love of God. They said of her, who suffered every day of her life, no one ever saw her unhappy. She was always filled with joy. And everywhere she went, when there were people fighting one another, she brought them together. And one day, there was a girl that was blind. She performed miracles almost every day. One day, there was a girl that was born blind, just like Margaret. And they brought the girl born blind to Margaret, and they said, cure her. And she said to the girl, I was also born blind. But you know that if you open your eyes, and you learn how to see, you know what you will see? You will see many beautiful things, but you will also see the sin of man. You will also see the ugliness of sin. I've never seen the ugliness of sin, and that's why I'm happy. I can cure you of your blindness, but if you really want to be happy, stay blind. And you will be happy like me. You don't need to see with the eyes of this world, but stay blind. And you will have a great happiness and a greater happiness like I have all for all eternity. The girl thought about it and said, no, I can't take it. Cure me, cure me, cure me. And so Margaret cured her. And the girl went away, and we know not what happened to her, but she did not become a saint. God sometimes allows those whom he loves he lets them suffer a bit. Sometimes you wander away from God, like St. Paul did. Saul wandered from God, and Saul hated God. And Saul would now be burning in hell if he was not made blind. And Saul would now be in the greatest of terrible places and absolute horror if he was not made to be knocked off his horse. You know that today there are many souls throughout the world being knocked off their horses. Many souls experiencing the sorrow of the life without God. And the devil is saying, don't return to God. You know what it says in Psalm 90, King David? In cubilibus vestris combungimini, in your bedrooms with compunction of heart, think of the things of God. He said that because the sinner, during the daytime and even until two in the morning when the bar is closed... He's able to make a lot of noise. Why is there noise in bars? Why do you have he headphones in your ear? Why must there always be loud noise to cover the voice of God? Because God speaks in a low and quiet voice, but he never stops speaking. And the sinner does not want to hear that voice, and therefore he cannot stand quiet. Because when it's completely quiet, the little voice of God the little voice of the conscience, the little voice of the good angel speaks. You have walked away from God. You are in misery. Return to God. Go back to the church, the Holy Roman Catholic Church. Go back to confession. Go back to God. Like the prodigal son who had to be at the very bottom of the pit. He had to be starving. He had to lose all the money he had. He had to be in the absolute greatest misery, even longing for the husks that the swine did eat. And the Jew is forbidden to have anything to do with swine, and he was amongst the swine. But it was there that he remembered his father's house, and his happiness began. Bishop Fulton Sheen said in the 1960s and 50s, he said, there are two things that always go together. The misery of man and the mercy of God. When man becomes miserable, it is then that he's finally ready to receive the mercy of God. And we are now heading into the most miserable of all times. There are many psychiatrists, many psychologists. There are many people in greatest agony. They can't stand their own lives. They drown their sorrows in drugs. They drown their sorrows in drink. They drown their sorrows in rock and roll. They drown their sorrows in fake activities. And it doesn't work. Because even today, one day your cell phone battery goes dead. 
One million Muslims walked into Germany a few years ago. They were dying of starvation. You know what they did? They were walking into Germany. By the way, only young men between the age of 18 and, 20 and 30, not girls. They caused right rape to many of the people and did many violence, much violence in Germany. When they finally arrived in Germany, they didn't say, give me bread. They said, where's an outlet? I got to plug in my cell phone. I need to charge my cell phone. They can live without eating, but they can't live without Facebook. And they can't live without the internet. And they can't live without noise around them all the times. They didn't look for bread, they looked for cell phone connections. We have become slaves to noise around us all the time because we are more and more empty of God. And God is more and more absent. Therefore, there's a great hole inside of us can only be filled by God. Saul fell off his horse and he was blind, but the grace of God took away his blindness, and the grace of God made him the greatest of the apostles. Margaret only saw God all her life. She would levitate every day. She was crippled and blind, and she was very ugly in the face, her twisted and contorted face. But when she went around with her goodness, everyone was attracted to her. And they said, what is it that attracts everyone to young Margaret? And they all said the same thing. It's her irresistible beauty. Because what is the cause of beauty? The presence of the innocence and the faith that comes from God. You know what it says in the book of Maccabees? the last book of the Old Testament, 153 years before Christ, the Jews went off to gymnasiums. They got involved in sex and rock and roll. They walked away from the temple and left it desolate. The priests started offering a false sacrifice. Then they, offered, then they became social workers like priests today. And they all became immersed in, in pleasure and games. And it says in the book of Maccabees, and the women's countenance of their face was changed. They no longer looked like ladies anymore. The innocence of children was lost. And ugliness filled Israel. And look at the world today. We don't have beautiful women anymore. They're all filled with tattoos. And they all have hard faces. The men have all become effeminate and have lost their masculinity. And ugliness is in the architecture, and ugliness is in the dress, and ugliness is in the styles, and ugliness is all around us, because beauty comes from God. And when you take God away, beauty disappears. And the way we bring beauty back into the world is to bring God back into our hearts, to bring God back into our souls, they had a great devotion to St. Simeon back in the Middle Ages. And priests used to speak little sermons about St. Simeon. Simeon lived a long time on this earth. He only did one good thing. One day a child came with the Blessed Virgin Mary and with St. Joseph into the temple. And for maybe 60 seconds, maybe 90, maybe even 120 seconds, he held Christ in his arms. And he said, Nunc dimiti servum tuum domine, secundum verbum tuum in pace. As we sing every night of the Office of Compline, the night prayer of the church. He held the Lord Jesus Christ in his arms. He says, Now dismiss thy servant, O Lord, according to thy word, in peace. Now let me die. I lived a long time, and they mocked me. But I have held Christ for a moment. And that's longer than it is needed. I held him for two minutes. And that's all I need for happiness. Hold Christ. Hold Christ and then die. And that's a happy life. And if you live 100 years and 500 years or 900 years like they did in the old days. And you hold not Christ. It is an empty and an ugly life. Hold your rosaries to the Blessed Virgin Mary. She will teach you about Christ. 
Talk to your Holy Mother, the Mother of God, who has only one thing on her heart, one thing on her tongue, one thing on her mind, and that's her Son. And she will teach us about Him and carry that faith in the heart. And no matter how far we've walked away from God, no matter how deep we are in the pit, all that is required is one touch of Christ, one touch of an angel, one act of sorrow, and it is all gone, and we are brought back to God. Mary Magdalene was in the greatest of sorrow on Easter Sunday morning when even the body of Christ was gone, and she was so sorrowful even unto death. But then she saw a stranger. She saw a gardener. And he touched her on the forehead and said, Noli me tangere, you cannot touch me now. And she embraced his feet and said, Rabboni, master. And all her sorrow was gone. We have many sorrows in our hearts. We have many wounds. All that it requires is the love of God, a good confession, the holding of a rosary, the word of Christ, and all the sorrow is gone. Because God is good. And good is is God. And there never can be any evil where God is. And evil is just the absence. It's just a taking away of the presence of God. Let's put that presence back. Say a little morning Hail Mary when you wake up. Say three Hail Marys before you go to bed. Talk to our Lord Jesus Christ a little bit during the day and he will fill your heart and sorrow will be blown away. We wear the color black at the funeral because it is the color of separation. And we are reminded of the mystery of night. When night comes, this room is completely dark. And you cannot see the pews, and you cannot see the wall, and you cannot see anything. Does that mean it's not there? It just simply means the light is taken away. But the pews are still there, and the wall is still there. It is only the light that's taken away. So also, Albert is here. The soul has gone before the judgment seat of God. God allowed him to receive the holy sacraments before he died. And his soul went before the judgment seat of God, and he is here, longing for our prayers, to pray that his soul be released of all the sins he committed during his life and forgiven of them, and released from the punishment of the fires of the purgation of purgatory, and brought quickly into the kingdom of heaven. And he awaits our prayers, and he's here. We don't see with our eyes because of the light problem, but he's here. The Lord Jesus Christ is here. The angels are here. It is just a darkness that separates us from our eyes. We're also reminded by these black vestments that we are not made for this life, for what is called light in this life is darkness compared to the light in the next. And the six candles remind us that he is, it was the number six, the number of our Lord Jesus Christ, number of man, and he carried the light of Christ inside of him, and his body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, and our bodies are temples of the Holy Ghost. Don't defile the body with sin. Don't defile the body with wickedness and turn always back to God. And at the end of the Mass today, we'll have the blessing of the Libra Ame. Deliver me, O Lord, from my sins and the sacred blessing of the casket and the incense into the casket of the body of Mr. Albert. And then also then we'll go over to the cemetery and bless the ground that's going to receive him. We will final blessing of the body and that will mark the conclusion. And God bless you then. God bless you all then. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.